Well, welcome everyone. We're going to get started, okay? Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see so many people here. I want to say a special welcome to Ole Miss Yaff that is visiting from out of town, as well as the thousands of people watching online. My name is Grace Baker, and I'm the chairman of the Memphis Young Americans for Freedom chapter. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Young Americans for Freedom, we are the premier student activist organization in the conservative movement. We work hard to educate our fellow students on America's founding principles, like individual freedom, free enterprise, limited government, a strong national defense, and the traditional American values that make our country so wonderful. I hope that you all enjoy tonight. If any of you would like to see more things like this done at Memphis, or just want to stay up to date with our school schedule this upcoming semester, remember to sign up at our information table uh, near the entrance. Tonight, I want to thank all of those who made this event possible. I want to thank Robert and Patricia Herbold, Young America's Foundation, The Daily Wire, that made our event possible so that Memphis students and thousands of others across the country could join us tonight for our exciting event. I would also like to thank my executive officers and members who labored day and night to make this event possible. Now let's get to the main event. Andrew Clavin is the author of such internationally best-selling crime novels as True Crime, films by Clint Eastwood, Don't Say a Word, uh, film starring Michael Douglas and The Empire of Lies. Stephen King called him the most original novelist of crime and suspense since Cornell Woolrich. He has been nominated for the Mystery Writers of America's Edgar Award five times and has won twice. He also has won the Thumping Good Read Award from W.H. Smith. His most recent book is The Great Good Thing, A Secular Jew Comes to Faith in Christ. His most recent work of fiction is the serial fantasy thriller and podcast Another Kingdom, which is available on iTunes and other podcast platforms. Clavin has also written thrillers for young adults, including the best-selling Homelander series, which follows a heroic teenager's battle against terrorists. His young adult novel, If We Survive, was nominated for an international a Thriller Writers Award, and his novel, Game Over, was nominated for Best Inspirational Novel by the publishing trade journal, Romantic Times. Andrew is a contributing editor to City Journal, the magazine of the Manhattan Institute, and has written numerous articles for them. His essays on politics, religion, movies, and literature have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and much more. He has also created the popular satire video series, Clavin on the Culture, for PJTV, a very serious commentary for Glenn Beck's Blaze TV, and the revolting truth for Truth Revolt. The Andrew Clavin show for The Daily Wire that features his iconic opening monologues uh, comes on Monday through Wednesday. His iconic opening monologues always prove to shine a humorous light on the current political landscape. So let's give the Andrew Clavin, and remember, there's no ease in Clavin, a warm Memphis welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I clearly, clearly you didn't get the the message, the boycott Andrew Clavin message from, from Antifa, which uh, accuses me of equating uh, Antifa with the KKK, and why I would equate people who wear masks and attack people violently with the KKK, I can't imagine. But, <laughs> but anyway, if there are people here who disagree with me, I'm going to try. I try to keep my speeches short, because what I really want is to talk to you. I already know what I think, and I want to hear your questions. And if you disagree with me, please you know, come to the front and, uh, and ask questions, and, and we'll talk. I always like to hear what people have to say. I was, I was asked to speak about, uh, let me check where we are so I'll know how long I'm talking. I was asked to speak about fake news. And I'm going to do that, and I just want you to know that everything I say about fake news, the news business, which I worked in for a while, is also true about Hollywood, which I also worked in for a while, and about the academy, about the university. Let's begin with this. A Gallup poll that was, came out just a couple of weeks ago says that 59% of Americans no longer trust the news media. 59% of Americans no longer trust the mainstream news media. That's a very disturbing statistic because it means that 41% of Americans are so stupid they would need an instruction manual <laughs> to peel an orange, right? I mean, if you trust the news media, you're about at the level of a guy who would drive a monster truck into a flaming pile of garbage because your best friend said it sounded cool, you know? 
I always feel when I want, I want to ask people, do, you know, do you trust the mainstream news media, raise your hand and then take your hand and smack it against your forehead and say, oh my God, I'm an idiot, you know? Now here's the thing, it, this is not just me talking about it, you only have to use your imagination. Let's say you had a, you know, a gazillion dollars and you wanted to start a news, a news outlet of some sort. And you thought, you know, I want to start a news outlet that just tells the truth, just tells the facts straight up. Fox News is there for the conservatives, MSNBC and NBC and ABC and CBS and the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and all the rest of the news outlets <laughs> are there for the liberals. But I want something that's just going to tell it straight. What would that look like? I mean, to me, it would look like three things. You would want people to get the facts, what's happening. You'd want people to find out basically the two sides. We have two sides, we have two major parties. You'd want people to hear from the left, you want people to hear from the right. Because of course, facts are shaped by values and they're shaped by opinions and the things that you want. Uh, the things that you want for the country, right? I'm a right winger, I want people to be free. It's most important to me that people are free. Left wingers tend to want more equality. It's more important to them that they have equality and of course equality and freedom can't go together because when people are free, some people are going to rise and some people are going to fall and if you have equality, you've got to force people to all be down on the same level. So we have different values, we have different things. So I'm going to create a news system that just tells the truth that everybody wants to hear because they want the facts because that is the point of news in a republic, right? The point of news in a republic is to tell people the facts and the, and the different points of view so they can figure it out for themselves, so they can figure it out and vote. So what would you do if you were going to do that? Well, the first thing that I would do is I would make sure that at the level of power, at the level of editorial power, there was a substantial mix of opinions, right? So that, I mean, this is, I was a reporter, I was a news writer, I was in the news business for many years. I worked with people who disagreed with me. I remember covering a story where a murderer got a, 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 a reprieve, he was going to get a new trial. And I busted my chops to get a jailhouse interview with this guy and I got it and I came back and wrote it up and it was all about what, you know, how happy he was and the, he was looking forward to having a new trial. And an editor came up to me and you know, said, somebody's been murdered and this guy may have done it. You've got to write for that family as well because he disagreed with my point of view. That helped me. So I would want editors who are arguing with each other. So when some guy came in and said, oh, I got the story that's really going to destroy Trump, the other guy said, you know what? That's not why we're here. We're here to also serve the people who, who like Trump. We're here to serve them both. That would be how I would get things fair. You have what is called uh, con conformity bias, conformity bias. When the sociologists, sociologists say you have social network homogeneity, when too many people agree, you not only become hardened in your opinions, you also become radicalized in your opinions, okay? So you'd want the numbers in your staff to be pretty balanced if you want a balanced news, news organization. Now the left should agree with this, right? Because they do everything by the numbers. If enough black people don't win Oscars, they think it's got to be bigotry. There couldn't be any other reason. If women don't get paid the same as men, it couldn't be because women make different life choices or take different jobs. It's got to be bigotry. If there are too many Asians who get into top schools, they say, oh, we've got to cut back on the number of Asians because we've got to balance the numbers. They're all about the numbers. So let's look at the numbers, all right? 7% of journalists identify as Republicans. 7% of journalists identify as Republicans. Four times as many, 28%, identify as Democrats. That means that 65% of all journalists are lying about being Democrats, okay? <laughs> I have worked in the news business, they're all Democrats. You know, a lot of news agencies will not let their reporters and journalists uh, contribute to political campaigns. But of those who contributed to political campaigns in the last campaign, 96%, 96% gave money to Hillary Clinton, okay? That's, that's where you are. You are getting Democrat news. You are getting news from Democrats all the time. And you may be a Democrat. That, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not here. I'm actually not here to convince you to take sides. I'm here to convince you you're being screwed by an industry that only tells things from one side. It's not good for you if you're a Democrat to be getting Democrat news. You want to be getting news from both sides. You want to hear what the other side says. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. Because when I say f fake news, 
A lot of times when people say fake news, what they mean are stories that aren't true. And there are lots of stories that aren't true, and yes, the industry being all Democrat tends to make stories that don't favor Republicans. So it's easy for a guy to send out a tweet saying, oh look, Donald Trump gave away the bust of Martin Luther King because somebody was standing in front of the bust of Martin Luther King and he couldn't see it at that moment. It didn't occur to him to check anybody because he hated Trump so much that he tweeted this out and this became a story for a day. That's true fake news. But my, what I'm going to put forward, my thesis that I'm going to put forward, is that it's all fake news because it is coming from one side of the aisle, all right? And that has an effect, and that's the effect that I want to talk about, all right? What I want to talk about is what it means to get so much of your news from one side of the aisle. And again, I'm going to be talking about Donald Trump and the way he's treated, but I'm not here to convince you that Donald Trump is a wonderful guy. I'm not here to convince you that he's a bad guy. I just want to record how he's being treated and what I think it does to you, no matter what side you're on, no matter which side you're on. So we're having a, quote, impeachment hearing. Now, some people say it's a fake impeachment hearing. I would say that, but they're declaring it's an impeachment hearing. It's being run by a guy, Adam Schiff, who has been trying to impeach Donald Trump literally since before he took office. Before he took office, they were talking about impeaching Donald Trump. First, he tried the Russian collusion story, didn't work. Then they tried, oh, he obstructed the Russian collusion investigation, didn't work. Now they've got this Ukraine story. I don't even want to go into it because it does, it's not that interesting a story. It's kind of a, I think it's kind of a silly story. I mean, th their basic argument is that he wouldn't give aid to Ukraine until they investigated Joe Biden, and that was somehow much worse than Barack Obama sending actual spies into his campaign and bugging his phones. Never mind. That's my opinion. I'm just giving you my opinion. But here's what's happening. Here's what's literally happening, all right? He is in a closed room having he these impeachment hearings. The, the rules of the Intelligence Committee are that they cannot release the trans, the, uh, trans uh, they, they can't release the documents telling you what people are saying. So nobody knows what they're saying, the transcripts. Nobody knows what they're saying. And yet, every single day, every single day, there's a leak to the news media that looks bad for Trump, okay? Every single day, there's a leak to the, so what we know, we know this, this is not me making this up, we know that Democrats are leaking news to Democrats, telling you what the Democrats want to come out of this hearing. We have no idea what's coming out of this hearing. So two days ago, there was a, a guy, a former ambassador to, to Ukraine, who came in and said he had problems, he thought that maybe Donald Trump was doing what they accused him of doing, quid pro quo aid. Maybe, he didn't have any direct information, he didn't have any direct knowledge of it, but he said that he worried about it. Let me just read to you how the three major networks reported this news. And remember, by the way, because all you ever hear from the left is Fox News, Fox News, Fox News. Fox News is one cable station with three million viewers. The networks have 30 million viewers, all right? So we're talking about much, much bigger audience, much more power, much more money. Here's the way they reported this news. This is the lead in each case. This is how the news opened, right? You know, it's a dramatic music. They come in. There's the person leaning in with a dramatic look. Nora O'Donnell of CBS Evening News says, today, Democrats called it the most damaging testimony to date against the President of the United States. And behind her came up the words explosive testimony. ABC anchor David Muir began the news. We begin with what the Democrats tonight are calling the most damaging testimony yet in the impeachment inquiry. And behind him came up the words explosive testimony. NBC's Lester Holt opened his program. President Trump's oft-repeated impeachment defense that there was no quid pro quo may have crumbled today under the weight of explosive testimony. And behind him, in case you didn't hear him, came up the words explosive testimony. Folks, I'm telling you, this was explosive testimony. I'm sure some of you are still cleaning up the debris in your dorm rooms from the explosion, all right? What is the effect of hearing bad news about Donald Trump coming from the other party as if it were the news? This is my problem. My problem is not, by the way, at all, that reporters should attack the President of the United States. He's the most powerful man in the world. They should be up his cuffs every single day, all the time, right? But after eight years of hearing Obama was scandal-free, scandal-free, he was a light worker, he was a light worker. What, what enchants you about the presidency, Mr. Obama? After eight years of that, to have this constant drumbeat against Donald Trump has two effects, right? On the left, it convinces you that anyone who could have voted for this guy, must, there must be something wrong with him. There must be something wrong with him. He must be evil or stupid or racist or something, right? He has to be. You wouldn't argue with a guy like that. You wouldn't discuss it with a guy like that. You boycott people like that. You shut them down. You yell at them. You scream at them. You come up to them in restaurants and throw milkshakes on them. Why would you, why would you have any respect for a fellow American who voted for the guy who is, who is 
portrayed this way in the news. And if you're on the right, you start to think like, hey, I don't want to listen to this anymore. I'm tired of being lied about. I'm tired of being called racist. I didn't vote for Donald, I don't, I'm not a racist. I didn't vote for Donald Trump for any reason having to do with race. I'm tired of being portrayed this way. I'm not listening anymore. So if there's stuff that they have to say, that Trump's opponents have to say, that might be useful for you to know, you don't know it. And this is what I'm trying to say. The fake news, the bias in the news, is cheating you out of one of the greatest experiences of life. The, one of the finest pleasures of life, and I would even say the purpose of life, is to learn the truth, is to find the truth. How do you do it? You live, you have experiences, you argue with people who disagree with you, you read things that you don't like, books that you want to throw across the room, you hear ideas you never heard before. That is how you find the truth. And I'm telling you, I'm 150 years old, you're 12, you don't know anything yet, right? I mean, you should be hearing everything. You should be hearing from every side, people you hate, people you disagree with, no matter who you are. And you should be hearing it every day, all the time. I read, I don't know, maybe four news sources very thoroughly every day, and it takes me that to get to do a 45-minute show in which I know that what I'm saying to people is factual. That's how hard it is to get the news. So if we're divided, and we have no way of getting the opinion of the other person, of respecting the other person and his opinion, we have these hot button issues that we can no longer talk about. And so I'm going to talk about them, all right? <laughs> I'm gonna just pick a, a couple of issues and tell you what I think is going on and why I think they're reported the way they are and what I think it does to you no matter which side you're on to hear it this way. Let's start with race because nobody lives forever. <laughs> you know, I, I think we can all agree that, that uh, African Americans, I, I hate the term African American, I think you're an American and you're not an American, but let's, let's call them black Americans. We all know what that means, all right? I think that it, we all can agree that black Americans got a raw deal in this country. Now, we can put it in context, we can talk about the fact that many of the founders knew this was a raw deal and wished it would go away, we can talk about all those things, but listen, that doesn't help you if you're getting the raw, raw deal, right? I mean, you got a raw deal. This is within my lifetime, there were laws on the books that discriminated against my fellow citizens for the color of their skin. That cannot be right. That cannot be in keeping with what America is supposed to be. We all know it. Everybody in this room knows it. Nobody is trying to deny it. My personal opinion, and this is my opinion, is that for the last 55 years, black Americans have been screwed by the Democrats. They have been screwed royally by the Democrats, and Republicans have abandoned them. All right? That's the way I, I feel about black people in America. And here's why I feel that way. There's a, there's a guy, a very talented young intellectual named Jason Riley. He's my colleague at uh, City Journal uh, at the Manhattan Institute, and he writes for the Wall Street Journal once a week. And he's a black guy. And he, he has studied this, and what he says is this. Before, through the 1950s, black people were finally freed of the kinds of oppression that had really dogged them in the past, and they were rising up into the middle class. They were there were more, marriage was increasing, uh, illegitimate births, which are a tremendous predictor of crime and suicide and drug use, to have a single parent family is a terrible, terrible disadvantage. I visited a lot of prisons in my life, and the one thing you can do is you point to each cell is fatherless child, fatherless child, fatherless child, right on down the line, all right? That's a disaster. All of these things were improving. Crime rates were improving. All of them were improving. In 1964, Lyndon Baines Johnson, a Democratic president, opened up what was called the Great Society and the War on Poverty, right? This was going to be all these billions and trillions of dollars of expenditure on welfare and benefits that were supposed to help all poor people, but especially black people. Since that time, and you can read Jason's book, it's called Stop Helping Us, okay? Since that time, things have gotten worse. The poverty rate has remained exactly the same, around 15%. Crime in the 80s and 90s in black communities reached epidemic levels, it reached hor horrific levels. The illegitimacy rate has turned upside down. It used to be in the neighborhood of 25% for black Americans, it's now in the neighborhood of 75% for black Americans, which is worse than in slavery days when Democrats were selling them down the river in a totally different way. They were selling them down the river for real and breaking up black families on purpose. Now, illegitimacy rates are worse than that. I mean, that is an amazing factor. And what Jason talks about is he talks about the wrong incentives of government programs. When you pay a guy not to work, whatever color he is, he ain't gonna work. When you pay a woman because she had a baby out of wedlock, 
no matter what color she is, she's going to have more babies out of wedlock. That's the kind of incentives that were driving people, uh, driving people into disrepair and dysfunction in poor communities in general, but black communities specifically, because there was an imbalance. If you look at the worst cities in America, there hasn't been a Republican mayor in most of them since Adam was a pup, all right? Detroit, the last elected Republican mayor, 1957. Chicago, 1927. St. Louis, 1949. Uh, last GOP of Philadelphia, 1952. Newark, in a century. Anybody know when the last Republican mayor in Memphis was? Never. Never been a Republican mayor in Memphis, okay? These are terrible places. These... <laughs> The, the, these, are, these are places where our fellow Americans who are black are living in really, really bad situations, okay? If, if Republicans had half a spine, they would be in those places every day saying, look at the facts, look at the numbers. But it's hard to take free stuff away from anybody. It's hard to take free stuff away from people. And once crime levels got so high, if the police go in and try to do their job to protect people by arresting the bad guys, because still, even at the worst epidemic levels, most of the people were good people just trying to get along. If they go in and arrest them, you're arresting somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's husband, and you're depriving a family of uh, the man in the house, which makes things even worse. So once the problem gets so bad, the people who come in and say, just do it a little more, to, what you need is a little more. Th those people have a voice. What happens? What happens when Republicans go in and try to change things? Well, I lived in New York during some of the worst crime days ever, okay? And in 1993, Rudy Giuliani was elected mayor. Now, today, Rudy Giuliani is a crazy old man, okay? <laughs> I think, I think that's just the truth. Then he was one of the greatest mayors, the, probably the greatest mayor the city ever had. He was a great federal prosecutor. He basically destroyed the mafia in New York. People don't talk about this anymore. Rudy Giuliani, because he was an honest prosecutor, basically took the mafia apart, and he was elected. Uh, when he was elected, the murder rate in New York, the year he was elected, 2,420 people were murdered that year in New York. Now, unfortunately, 50% of murder victims are black, so you know that a lot of these people were black people. When he left, 960 people were murdered, and if you follow the chart about two years after he takes office, it goes like this, okay? 960 is still a lot, but it's less than half the number. It's estimated that 4,000 black Americans are still alive because of Rudy Giuliani and the police chiefs he put in, in power in New York City. Every single day, he was called racist. He was called racist. His cops were called racist. There was a horrible incident where a man named Ab Abner Luima was beaten up by a bunch of rogue cops. Giuliani dropped on these guys like a bat out of hell. Well, I, think, I think most of them went to prison. I can't remember if all of them went to prison. However, the story was this was Giuliani's fault. The, the story was spread around that the cops, while they were beating this man up, and they really tortured him. I mean, the guy was kind of a thug, but they really tortured him. The story went around that they shouted, it's Giuliani time. This story made all the papers, all the TV shows, it was utterly untrue. Even the victim eventually admitted it was utterly untrue. But it's just a symbol of how he was treated every single day. Now you gotta have a hide of steel to take that. Nobody likes being called a racist. My friend Bill Whittle points out calling people racist only works on people who aren't racist because they're the only ones who feel bad when you call them that, right? I mean, racists don't care. You know, the Klan, you know, you call them racist. What do they say? Like, well, you know? So, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's people, it's good people. It's good people who feel bad. You gotta have a hide of steel. And now we're seeing, seeing it with Donald Trump. I have a lot of problems with Donald Trump. I'll be honest with you, I, I voted for him, I'm gonna vote for him again, and I support him, and I think he's been a successful president. But I, look, the guy's got personality difficulties, okay? The one thing I think he's not is racist. The one thing I think he's not, he just wants to fix stuff. That is Donald Trump's personality. He wants to fix stuff economically. Remember he got up and he said to, to the black community, what the hell have you got to lose? He was right. Today, the unemployment rate amongst African Americans has hit a record low. Okay, for the first time in years, the crime, the crime rate, the poverty rate has dropped. And not only has the poverty rate dropped, but more people are getting out of poverty, which was kind of amazing because the population is always increasing, right? So if the poverty rate stays the same, the number of people goes up, but it's gone down. 1.4 million people have gotten out of poverty under Donald Trump. 
And you see what they do to him. I mean, come on. You know, this stuff of where he said, oh, there are good people on both sides, and they pretend that he said that about racists and about uh, Nazis, when in the se three sentences later in the same speech he said, I'm not talking about the racists. I'm not talking about the Nazis. They should be universally condemned. That's what he actually said. And yet that speech is given again and again. So what does that mean? What does that mean? How can we have a discussion? Look, I have an opinion. I told you my opinion. I think black people are being screwed by Democrats. You can have a different opinion. You can think some of these programs work. Maybe some of them work, some of them don't. Maybe I'm you know, painting this with too broad a brush. We can have a debate about that. But we can't have a debate where one side is, here's money, and the other side is, you're a racist. That's stupid, OK? That's childish. That's people reducing you to the level of childishness. It's stripping you of the ability to find the truth by arguing back and forth and discussing ideas. That's what I feel fake news is. It's stripping you of this. Let's talk about abortion, because why not? Uh, <laughs> I wrote a movie called Gosnell. Gosnell is about the worst serial killer in American history. He was an abortionist. He worked in Philadelphia for decades, I think 30 years at least. He, was, he would do abortions past the legal time. And let me tell you that I'm, I oppose abortion in, entirely, completely, okay? But I understand that children that you don't want can cause terrible, terrible problems, and especially for people who are poor. So it's not like I'm unsympathetic, I just oppose it. But that's my point of view. Gosnell was killing babies. Gosnell would deliver the babies of women who were way past the legal point when they were supposed to have abortions, and then he'd murder them. The descriptions of what happened in his filthy clinic, which was covered in cat litter and grime and dirt, and where he, uh, Gosnell himself was a black man, but he was a terrible racist. He would give white people the clean room at the top, white women the clean room at the top, and black people the, these grimy, grimy rooms. The descriptions of what was happening in there are out of a horror movie, except nobody would make the horror movie because nobody could stand it. I mean, the baby screaming, the blood, the killing, it was just, he was a murderer. The guy was a murderer. He finally, finally got arrested by cops who accidentally stumbled on him while, uh, while investigating a drug scam. He was put on trial for a number of these murders. The guy who produced this mo movie, who hired me to write this movie, happened to be passing through Philadelphia and saw that he, he was a journalist. He thought, what's going on at the courthouse? Oh, wow, there's a trial of the worst serial killer in American history, right? Boy, the press is going to be all over this thing. Take a guess how many reporters were in the courtroom at the time. You got it. There were zero reporters covering this trial. Why? Because the descriptions of what Gosnell were doing and the descriptions of regular abortion were the same thing. And they did not want to jeopardize what they consider a very important right, the right to abortion. Because they're all Democrats. Because they're all on one side. Zero people covering the trial of the worst serial killer in American history. It finally, Kirsten Powers, a left-wing journalist writing in the USA Today, said, this is disgraceful. This is a murder story. You should be covering a murder story. And a couple of guys kind of wandered in. We made this movie. It took us, it took them years. I have to salute the grit of the producers, because it took them years to get even a million bucks, which is nothing in a movie budget, to get this thing produced. And even, even when we put it in to movie theaters, uh, they would have problems with the projectors. They would reschedule it at the last minute. They did everything they could to stop this information from coming out. Again, again, we can have a debate. Civilized people, good people, can have a debate about abortion. We can talk about my point of view. I'm telling you, I'm all on one side. But I do understand the pain and suffering of having a child you can't afford. I understand the pain and suffering of having a child you don't want. I understand or, or a child who's maybe damaged in some way. I understand all that. That's a debate, something that two people who treat each other decently like human beings, that's a debate that people can have. When I interviewed for research, when I interviewed the prosecutor, who tried, the, uh, who tried Gosnell, she told me that when they were interviewing prospective jurors, they would ask them about abortion because they didn't want the people to have such strong feelings about abortion that it skewed their uh, feelings about Gosnell. None of the men would give an opinion. The men were so cowed, so afraid of giving an opinion on the subject that they said, I, d I don't have an opinion on that. How can you not have an opinion? Half the children who were being killed, obviously, are male. You should be able to have an opinion. That's the thing that, is, that makes me a little crazy about the news, that we can't have a debate about these serious, serious issues. I'll do one more, one more uh, issue, gay marriage. And I, I talk about this one, first of all, I'm, I kind of don't care about it, so I, I, you know, I don't care whether gay people get married or not. They're going to live, I feel they should live together freely, whatever. 
I just want to tell one quick story. Shepard Smith, the guy who just left Fox News, a liberal gay newsman who dominated the middle of the Fox News lineup because there are more left-wing reporters at Fox News on any given day than there are conservative reporters on the networks all month long, okay? So Shepard Smith, liberal guy, brought on, during the gay marriage debate, brought on a very strong anti-gay marriage spokesman, Rick Santorum, former senator from Ohio, I believe. Now let me ask you, and I don't know how many of you are on the left, how many of you are on the right, but just what's the fair question? In the middle of the debate about gay marriage, what's a fair question to ask a guy about gay marriage? If it were me, what I would ask him is, why are you opposed to gay marriage? What, what's, what's your reasoning? What's your reasoning? Then I'd bring on a guy who was for gay marriage and ask him. Maybe I'd put them together and let him argue, you know? But I would let people find out what the arguments are. Here's the question Shepard Smith asked, word for word, this is verbatim. How much longer do you think that being anti-gay rights is going to be something that's a conservative principle? And when do you think that folks like yourself, who said that having a gay marriage is a bit of a hit to faith and family in America, how long do you think it'll be before you catch up with the rest of the country and realize everybody's okay? How are you supposed to answer that? You're a serious guy who thinks this is a serious issue. How are you supposed to give an issue? Here was what Sam Torum said. Everybody, of course, is entitled to live the life they want. The question is whether we should change the laws of this country to reflect a different value structure. That statement is 100% true, right? That statement is 100% true. That's the question. Shouldn't he be allowed to make his argument? How can you have an argument? Look, the one thing that's not true, that we know is not true, is the sides are for gay marriage and hate. That's a child's way of thinking, right? That's not the way adults think. We are all being reduced to adults. Let me finish up. I, I really want to talk to you, so I'll finish up. But I, I want to tell you this. President Trump has been so expert at taking hold of the phrase fake news that people forget that it was a left-wing phrase to begin with. It began with a group, and this is work done by the investigative reporter Cheryl Atkinson. It began with a group called First Draft, which pretended that it was out to stop fake news, but was in fact, this is at the end of the, the 2016 election, it was in fact funded by some of Hillary Clinton's biggest funders. They started this campaign against fake news, and at the exact same time they started the campaign against fake news, oddly enough, Barack Obama started making speeches about uh, fake news, and how news had it needed to be curated, right? We needed to edit the news because he said it's the wild, wild west out there. At the same time, Hillary Clinton started making exactly the same speeches. In other words, it was a coordinated effort. And what they ended up doing, with the help of a guy, a terrible, terrible guy named David Brock, who started an uh, anti-conservative hit group called Media Matters, which is after the Daily Wire every day, okay? What they finally managed to do is they fan finally managed to talk social media companies like Facebook and Google and YouTube into bringing on left-wing groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center and uh, Snopes to curate their news. And as a result, as a result, crazy guys like Alex Jones were tossed off social media because nobody cared about him because he was crazy. We should have stood up for him because he had the right to free speech, but we didn't because he was nuts. So they threw him off. He, you know, he, he was, but they threw him off. But then, of course, once they know that they can get away with it, they came after everybody. If you go on Twitter and say, you know what, I'm sorry, God bless you if you're transgender, but I don't think a man who says he's a woman is a woman in fact. That's just not scientific truth, okay? You can get thrown off Twitter for that. You can get thrown off Twitter for holding to views that Christians have believed for thousands of years. I have been threatened with being banned. My friends have almost all been banned for one thing or another, temporarily banned. My videos are constantly demonetized. Uh, Prager use videos, I've done PragerU videos, the guy is an intellectual who puts forward conservative arguments, they've been banned from being seen by children as if they're pornography, okay? One side in this country, the left, has started a war against free speech. One side, but it hurts both sides. It hurts both sides. The purpose of life, the joy of life, the direction of life is to find the truth. You do that by listening to the people who disagree with you. You do that by hearing the news straight and then hearing the opinions about it. And fake news has robbed us of that. And basically, I just think that that's a crime. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Clavin, for your wonderful lecture. Oh, it's, um, it's fine. I've and, covered uh, race, abortion, and uh, and um, gay marriage. Gay marriage. Uh, Shapiro is probably having a heart attack somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we will, he will now be taking questions now. So if you do have a question, um, we'll a we will ask you to please walk around the back here. And my VP uh, Cassidy and Secretary uh, Ashlyn will be directing you there. Um, please keep your questions to one. Um, if y'all do have any questions, please come to the mic now. Sorry. Hey, Mr. Clavin, my question is, um, how do you convince people that it's better for them to actually question their values and talk with you about things that they disagree about? Well, you know, it's, it is funny. I think one of the things I try to do is I try to start by telling them what it is I want because what I want is for people to be free. That's really what I want for people. I want them to be free. I want them to be free and happy. I'm too old to care what you do with your lives. I am, you know, by the time you ruin this country, I'll be out of here, you know? So, <laughs> so, so really, I start by telling them what I want. And the thing is, most people think they want to be free. Most people think they want to be free. And once you get people to acknowledge that, then you can start to discuss it. Now listen, there's some people who are gonna hate you. I mean, there are always haters. There's some people who aren't gonna listen. There's some people who are irrational. Why waste your breath? You know, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to move them. You're just going to give yourself aggravation. But if you start, you know, what, what is the, the kind word turns away wrath? If you start by saying, listen, this is what I believe in, and I'm willing to get there any way that, that works, then you can start to argue about with them about why uh, they're, what they're saying will take you away from freedom. And one of the things that I get very angry with conservatives about is they're always talking about money, but they're never talking about freedom, you know? Money's nice. Freedom is necessary, and I think that that's the, always where you should start on because it's a high ideal, and most people agree with it. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first off, you don't know how far I drove to get here. <laughs> I am a student at the University of Tennessee Pharmacy School. Okay. I really want to be a pharmacist, and one my biggest fears is that one day a patient's going to walk in with a child and I'm going to look at the prescription and it's going to be a testosterone or an estrogen blocker. And I don't believe in that, but at the same time, the doctor ordered that prescription. I've got a duty to work with them. I've got a duty to work with the other healthcare professionals and they're saying this is what needs to be done to this child and I'm just, that goes against my values. How would you respond to that sort of situation? You know, I, I have to be honest with you, and I, I know this is not the answer you want to hear, and I don't know the law about it. I don't know pharmaceutical law, so I, you know, I'm just telling you what, I could never do that to a kid. That, that to me is child abuse per se, and I'll tell you why. It has nothing to do with transgenderism. I certainly have no you know, animosity toward people who ha are uncomfortable in their own bodies. I think that must be a terrible, terrible, painful way to, to live, okay? No child knows what he is, he only knows what he's told. Mm -hmm. a, child, a child who is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, really doesn't have any clue about this. And to take away from him or her, uh, his gender, his, uh, the gender that he was born with, to take away from him his sex, because that's what it is, is a crime. And I could not participate in child abuse, uh, even if it cost me whatever it cost me. I simply couldn't do it. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I wish I could give you a compromise no. answer, but that's, that's the truth. I didn't ask a pharmacist, I asked you because I listened to your show and I want the, I want the moral answer, <laughs> not the pharmaceutical answer. I can ask my teachers that any day. I asked you. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. No, sure. Thank you. All right. So my question was, um, so when I was younger and Obama was uh, in office, I noticed that even Fox News, they kind of, um, they seemed a little more aggressive. It kind of seemed like a reverse of what's happening right now, I would say. Do you, and it, you know, as somebody who didn't really follow politics that much, it was hard for me to look at what Fox News is putting out and be like, you know, this isn't 100% news. I can definitely tell there's a little more passion behind this. So, um, I really a two-pronged question here. One question, my first is, do you think that a lot of the exaggerated fake news, if you will, uh, is, um, do you think that it is a tactic to kind of distract away from 
their own party's dirty laundry? And then also, do you think that if like the New York Times or if the Washington Post or any of these other mainstream outlets occasionally made it look like they're unbiased by reporting a positive conservative story or something like that, do you think that they would uh, do more damage in their attacks if they it wasn't so obvious that they had an agenda? <laughs> well, yes, for, for that last question, sure. But I mean, here's the thing. Fox News has a lot of commentary on it. I mean, Sean Hannity comes on and says, I am Sean Hannity. I will go with Trump no matter what he does. Here's why I feel that way. That, to me, is a completely honest thing to do. On my show, I very rarely go after the liberal side, MSNBC, because they're openly left wing. They say, we are liberals. This is what we believe. This is how we see the news. I think, OK, I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, The New York Times is a very different thing. You ever see the movie Men in Black? Remember how the alien eats that guy and then lives inside him, and the guy kind of shambles around? The, the New York Times, which I call a former newspaper, because it used to be a great newspaper. And what the left does is it takes over organizations that have earned respect, like uh, the New York Times, Yale University, Hollywood Studios. It takes them over, and it uses that respect to promote leftism. And that's my problem. That's a dishonest thing to do. The front page of the New York Times is spread out as if they're giving you the news. They lie. They lie every day. They lie in, in such deep in terrible and stupid ways that I really feel I don't understand. I seriously don't understand how you can put your tie on them, how you can look in the mirror long enough to put your tie on in the morning. So I have no brief against uh, Sean Hannity, and I have no brief against Rachel Maddow either. I, obviously, I'm more on Hannity's side than Maddow's, but that's fine. I want them to debate. The only really great show on Fox News that I watch all the time is Brett Baer's show because he plays it straight. He tells the news. For the first 45 minutes of that show, he gives you the news. And that's what I'm looking for. So. Yes, of course, you could, you could promote your stupid left-wing ideas better if you at least were fair about things. But I think these guys have lost the plot of what they're doing. I think they've lost the reason for what they're doing. I started out by saying that the purpose of news is to inform people in a republic so they can make up their own minds. That is the purpose of news, like opening a wine bottle is the purpose of a corkscrew, OK? That's the purpose. If you're not doing that, you're doing something else besides news. And my complaint is they are doing something else besides news, and they keep uh, demanding the rights and respect of journalists. That's my problem. Uh, for starters, thank you so much for coming. Um, I didn't know that about Memphis uh, regarding Republican versus Democrat. That makes a lot of sense now. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I guess my question is more on the lines of like being uh, on the artistic side. You've written many books. Yeah. You've been working in Hollywood. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a writer. I've been writing a book and got it self-published uh, over the past seven years now. And one thing I've kind of noticed is that the publishing industry has rapidly changed in the past 10 years, let alone the past seven years. Yeah. Uh, is there any kind of creative input that you can give from having being traditionally published to being uh, self-published, having a podcast, audio version? Where is this going and what route should con especially conservatives be focusing in for the arts? Well, publishing is and has been for you. Publishing, I always used to say, and I worked in, you know, I, as a writer, I worked in publishing, was the, the worst uh, run business besides the federal government. You know, you know that's, it's, it really is a badly running. It's very old fashioned. It's, it, goes, it has roots back in the 18th century and it basically publishes as if it were still the 18th century. Obviously technology has changed everything. When I wrote Another Kingdom, I decided to go for a podcast because I wanted to reach an audience directly. I wanted to reach a younger audience. I thought, I, thought I'm, I go out here, they know how to sell my crime books but they won't know how to sell a fantasy book. And it was a, a huge success. But it, we didn't know it was going to be a success. And I did it by myself with no, I did it, I'd like come over my house and record this book. And we did it ourselves the first time out there with help from our friends at the Daily Wire, but they didn't promote it or anything. And it was big, it was a big deal. I, I have been preaching for people, I, I always joke with my wife that I go out and make these speeches and say, people should do this, people should do that, and then I end up doing it. So it's like I, I just should stay home and talk to myself. And, <laughs> But I went out to conservatives 15 years ago and said, you guys do not pay attention to the arts. You don't pay attention to the culture. It's the arts that shape the culture. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. I said, there's all this new technology, use it. So that's what I would say to you. So I ended up doing that, right? 
That's what I would say to you. Use the new technology. Don't, don't have stars in your eyes. It's much better to get published by a mainstream publisher than it is to publish yourself. It is much better. They have a lot of uh, advertising power. They have a lot of prestige that will get you reviews, which you won't get if you self-publish. It's very, very hard to sell a book that you self-publish. Okay. Don't kid yourself about it, but it's guerrilla warfare. It's guerrilla warfare. They are an empire of lies. They are, they, they are an empire of lies, and we are popping up from behind the trees, pop, popping at them with our flintlocks and our pistols. You do everything you can to get your stuff out there, okay? So listen, I, you know, if I, were, if I were starting now, I would try to go the mainstream route, and then I would invent ways to sort of get around the, and, and really get to people. I don't think it helps to throw your stuff out there without promoting it, but you've got to figure out a whole plan on how to do it. And there are books about it and things like that. You can learn how to do it and learn how to do it pretty well. So, Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Hi, Mr. Clavin. A uh, big fan of you and the, guy, and the other guys at the Daily Wire. Um, I guess my question for you is, with all that's going on in China right now, as far as the Hong Kong protests, and our trade war with them. Do you think, and you know, as, as I'm sure you know, it's still a, hu a really big communist country. Why are we still allowing such communist, like such a superpower to still be communist? Are, do you think a war with um, China is plausible or feasible? No, no, that'd be a disaster. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, I, and of course, yeah. no one likes war, but it, it's just interesting to me that w they have so much stock in our economy, and that they are open about censoring their own citizens. And um, w I think what really drew uh, drew the line for me was seeing all these protesters hold up the American flag and promote free speech and stuff like that. And I just was curious about why we still allow this communist superpower to roam free? Well, because the simple answer to that is because power is limited and our power is as limited as anybody. But make no mistake about it, the Chinese government is a government of monsters, okay? I mean, this is not, there's no black and white here. This is a government that slaughtered 65 million of its own people. That's eight times the population of New York. Each one of them just as real to himself as you are to yourself, okay? So they slaughtered 65 million people. Until 2015, they were tying women down so that's four years ago. They were tying women down and forcing them to be sterilized and forcing them to have abortions. Their dissidents disappear and then they take their organs and sell them, which sounds to me like something I would make up, okay? I mean, that doesn't even sound like a real thing. It's a real thing. This is a, a bad, bad group of people, okay? So when LeBron James comes out and doesn't, you know, after uh, disrespecting the American flag, comes out and says, I can't stand up against China, he's wrong. When Sha Shaquille O'Neal, who is a, a giant of a man in more ways than one, came out and said, no, we have free speech, we're gonna say whatever we want, you know, that's what we want our athletes to say, that's what we want our, Quentin Tarantino said it, I don't even like Quentin Tarantino, but he's all right with me now. I'll go back and see his movies again. <laughs> you know, this is, it's a major, major thing. And, you know, I, I used to joke that Google used to have the phrase, don't be evil, that used to be their slogan. They should have just changed it just a little bit because, because they, you know, they have done horrible evil things in working with China. And we have got to come out and, and speak up about this. And, and Trump has done a good job of, putting them on their back heels. I think that's a wonderful thing he's done. He gets no credit for it whatsoever. You know, maybe it's all money in his mind, but I think it goes beyond that. Uh, and I think that we have to say, yeah, yeah, I want a cheap iPhone. You know, yeah, I want to trade with China. I don't want to, I don't want to take, look, China has never been free. It's not going to be free tomorrow. It's not going to be free next year. It's not that we can make them free, but I think we do have to speak up and not, um, and not be cowardly about it. it, it you know, it drives me nuts because they're such phonies. I mean, the Disney company does movie after movie where they give you a different color Disney princess to show you how, uh, you know, tolerant they are and how we should all be tolerant. And meanwhile, the Chinese are putting religious minorities in concentration camps, and Bob Iger won't say a thing about it. You know, I mean, that's absurd. So look, we can't have you can't have a war that would destroy. It would destroy the world. I mean, and, and it's not a question of forcing them to be who we are. It's a question of us maintaining our principles so that they are forced to acknowledge them, which is what we did to the Soviet Union, and ultimately the Soviet Union on its own weight came tumbling down, and that's what we want to do to China. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.
First of all, thank you, Emperor Clavin, Lord of the Multiverse, for <laughs> deigning to grace us with your presence. Now I have to. Now I have to kill you. Now that you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been in the news a lot recently. You know, he's been giving congressional testimony. Uh, you know, they had the heated exchange with AOC. A lot of people have been covering it. And I've been noticing that it seems like he's getting a lot more favorable press coverage recently now that he is siding with the most basic principles of free speech. Whereas, you know, just not too long ago when he banned, you know, Alex Jones, you know, Paul Joseph Watson, Laura Loomer, you know, even Louis Farrakhan, who I think is a complete schmuck, you know, but he deserves to be on the platform. Yep. You know, uh, he's getting a lot more favorable coverage now, and I'm just curious what you think about that. It, you know, I understand the power of positive reinforcement, you know, you want to reinforce good behavior, uh, but, you know, do you think that he, you know, he's deserving of that, or is it just sort of a tribal aspect? Okay, I, 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 I do not know whether Mark Zuckerberg is deserving of that. I can tell you that I don't trust him, and I, and, and here's the reason I don't trust him. He's constantly apologizing for things that he does over and over again. So he's always gives the same speech. You know, I take personal responsibility for the fact that we did this, and then he does the same exact thing over and over again. He's looking at an election coming down the pike. They keep telling us that Trump is double digits behind you know, the opposition. If Trump is double digits behind the opposition, I will eat my shoes because I'm telling you, the guy, first of all, the guy, it's not just the guy filling stadiums, it's the fact that the Democrats are trembling in their shoes. They can't find anything to impeach him on and they know they haven't got to get this. So Mark Zuckerberg is looking at maybe another Trump administration. The federal government on both sides has started to threaten him with breaking up his monopoly, which I'm not sure is a bad idea, by the way. I, I haven't quite thought it through, but I'm not sure that's a terrible idea. However, he's looking at this and he's thinking, free speech is the way to go here, because I don't know what's gonna happen, right? <laughs> so free speech is gonna suit him until the minute the Democrats win, and then I don't think there's gonna be free speech anymore. So I, that's, that's, my, feel, that's my, feel, my gut feeling about it. You know, he, he knows exactly one Republican, Ben Shapiro, that's the only one he knows, you know? And, and you know, I'm glad he's talking to Ben, but I always warn Ben, sometimes these guys are just trying to eat you last, you know? And I think that, I, I worry about this with Zuckerberg. I can't guarantee it, that's my gut feeling, okay? Like every white supremacist, like uh, the events in Charlottesville, Virginia. Every, you have to speak up. I'm a little. Uh, the events in Vo Charlottesville, Virginia. You remember, like two years back. I, I couldn't understand. Sh in Charlottesville, Virginia, like two years back. Charlottesville, Charlottesville Virginia, two years back. Two years back. Yeah, there was a white supremacist event. So whatever happened, like st Donald Trump came out and saying, like there were both there were good people on both sides of the aisle, and like he also started condemning people, like like people of color, like to go back to their own country because I'm an immigrant here and I feel like I was being told that. So what is this like? Okay, Tr Trump has a big mouth and he speaks without, talk without thinking, no question about it. But let's, let's take a look at this both people on, uh, good people on both sides, honestly. Uh, well Excuse I, me, let me, let me, okay. let me, let me say this is what happened. There was an argument in the town of Charlottesville, a local argument about the naming of a park and the p placing of statues. Again, a perfectly good debate. I can understand why a black taxpayer might say, hey, I don't want the statues of these guys in my park. I can understand why another guy might say, hey, I do, this is part of the history. It's an argument that civilized people can have, right? People descended on that town. It's a local argument. It has nothing to do with any of the rest of us. People descended on that town. The Antifa guys, who I think the Fa in Antifa stands for fascist, the Anti stands for nothing, okay? They, 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 if, you're, if you're wearing masks and hitting people you disagree with, you are a fascist. That is the definition of being a fascist. The other guys were open fascists, so it was fascists against fascists as far as I was concerned. These were, these were stinky people fighting with one another. Somebody got killed because of one of the right-wingers. Trump, in his inarticulate way, was saying that the people in the Charlottesville argument had good people on both sides, which of course was true. Go back and read the transcript of the speech. He immediately afterwards, three sentences down, says, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis. They should be condemned universally. He says it in the speech. So they take it out of, out of context. You know, the phrase, go back where you came from, I don't actually believe he was saying that. He, I believe he was saying it to Ilhan Omar. It was directed at Ilhan Omar. But still, it's, it's, it's stupid to say it. It's stupid to say it. I, I agree with you. It's stupid to say, but it doesn't mean the guy is racist. In fact, if he were racist, he'd be a lot more careful. I think the problem with Trump is he doesn't care. He really doesn't care who people are or what they are. He just wants to, to, to win. 
Well, he represents all of America. Maybe he should start caring about what he speaks. Hey, listen, I think every Trump supporter I've ever met, every Trump supporter I have ever met says, you know, I love the guy. Even the guys who love him say, I love the guy. I wish he would shut the hell up, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, so, so look, I, I mean, the, the thing about it is, though, look, far, it's basic Forrest Gump. It's Forrest Gump 101. Stupid is as stupid does, OK? If he, if this, this is a guy who was a very, I, I was in New York when he transformed the skyline. He was a very successful real estate uh, guy, developer. He was a very successful TV star. If he's a racist, he is the worst racist I've ever met. He is doing great things for black Americans. Look, just talking about what he does, I too wish he would shut up. I, I will give you that. But look at what he does. I mean, I think that the proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, well, the statues you told, those, ref those reflect like American, Americans who fought for slavery la rather than against slavery. I don't think those statues should be there because like I, those people, they fought for the slavery. No, no, that's not true. They fought for their country. They, they thought, that was there. listen, listen, we can disagree about that. That's fine. There's, there's no reason the taxpaying citizens of a city shouldn't have that argument and decide that among themselves. There is a reason why guys in masks and guys with tiki torture should, dis should descend them. They should not do that, right? People, that is an argument. People debate things. That's the way people disagree. They see things differently. That's fine. That's part of being an American. Part of being an American is having people disagree. Not part of being an American is beating the crap out of each other because you come from different points of view. That, that's, that's, the, that's basically what it comes down to. Hey, my question would be, at the beginning of your speech, you mentioned that you were more personal freedom than um, equality, in a manner of speaking, I'm sure. And I, of course, agree with that to some extent. But then it seemed as I was listening to your speech, when your, your, it seemed like your argument against fake news was that we needed more equality in the opinions in news, which I don't think is a bad thing, but when you say at first you're more freedom than equality, how would you justify that? A perfectly good question. I'm for, when I, I believe when the founders said uh, we should have equality, what they meant was equality of treatment, that each one of us is made in the image of God, we should get the same justice. I should get the same justice as a billionaire, as a poor person when I stand before a trial court. That's the ideal, obviously. It doesn't happen, we all know that, but, but that's the ideal. That's what we're aiming for. We're aiming for people being all the same in the eyes of the law. That's the equality. The equality I'm not for is what's called the quality of outcomes, where everybody winds up in the same place, because that's just not gonna happen. I mean, they talk about privilege, and people talk about this privilege and that privilege, and I always say, well, you know, LeBron James was born with, like, I can't hit a basketball shot for the life of me, and I would love to be a, an NBA basketball star. He has LeBron pr privilege. Everybody has something, right, that they can use. I, I just think that the, the kind of equality the left wants requires oppression to achieve. It requires oppression for uh, you know, a, a brilliant guy to not be as successful and as rich as a not brilliant guy. And it's not fair, but that's life, you know, so that's the kind of equality I'm talking about. I certainly believe, I certainly believe that when you're talk, trying to tell the truth, you should try to tell the truth, you know, and we disagree. I, I disagreed with that guy who was just up here, but I, I, that's not a sin. It's not a sin for him and I, for he and I to see things differently. Okay, so I guess I maybe even should be more specific. Do you think that equality of outcomes, as you just said, in the media is the way that we combat fake news? I don't think, the, I think the only way that the news can be reformed, and I think our news media seriously needs reform, but I'm a First Amendment purist. There's nothing we can do to force them to reform except shame them into it and beat them by competition. It, you know, I mean, the thing about Fox News is it was so successful. Charles Krauthammer said they found a niche, it just happened to be 50% of the population. You know, it, it, they, they have demonized Fox News. They've turned it into a curse word. But they do, some, they do good stuff, you know? And I mean, I think that they've served a need that was, open, that was open there. So I think we have to compete with them. I think we have to start um, news outlets that do the kinds of things I'm talking about, that treat people fairly, that give people both sides. I get something called the flip side in my mailbox every day that tells me what both sides are saying about a, an issue is really helpful to me, you know? And, and that's the way I think we do it through competition. We cannot touch them because of the First Amendment, which I believe in wholeheartedly. So I, I don't know what else to say. This doesn't seem to be, I, I do not want to sacrifice the freedom of the press, but I do think they need to be re to reform themselves, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> Hey, Mr. Clavin, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I mean, I'd agree, but I do uh, appreciate your point of view. 
Um, you said earlier in your speech in terms of race, you talked about uh, Democrats are screwing black people. I agree with that to an extent. Simultaneously, Republican outreach to black Americans is, for lack of a better term, trash. Pitiful. Yeah. Um, there are, especially older black people growing up in a black community, I'm from Memphis, so growing up here, a lot of older, middle-aged, my parents' age and my grandparents' age, black people are pretty socially conservative. Um, I think the issue is, is that instead of reaching out, y'all back away. And the effort isn't there. Uh, black people don't vote Democrat because of free stuff. That's a narrative that's constantly set on the right and is disingenuous and it's not helpful. White people get the most food stamps, welfare, and every other social program in America. And yes, it's obviously because y'all make up the majority, but still, the narrative is that we get it the most and that we abuse it. And factually, white folks abuse it the most. Um, I guess my question is, what outreach can you guys do to get more um, black people to your party? Because I'm sorry, Candace Owens, that, that's not it. <laughs> it's just not like she, like, she doesn't talk to black people saying, hey, this is why you should vote. She calls us slaves on the Democratic plantation. I know, I know. And then there are white conservatives who repeat that. And then when I say, y'all are racist for saying that, I'm not racist, but you just call me a slave on a Democratic plantation. How, do, how can you pull me from, I'm a liberal, how do you pull me from this side to that side if you call me a slave on a Democratic plantation? Now, you may not be racist, but that's a racist statement. So when I hear that, I'm like, He's a racist. I, I can't listen to this person. So what outreach do you think that you guys can do for African Americans to actually move us toward that party? I think I'm not going to join, but I just want to. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I, I think when you hear that kind of language, what we're hearing is frustration because of the kinds of things I talk about. When people do try to do things to help poor communities, because basically I don't think a black poor community is any different than a white community, as you're saying. I think that's, it's, it's poverty that causes behaviors, not the, uh, not the color of people's skin. Uh, you know, that language is the frustration of people who feel that every time they open their mouth, they get shouted down as racist. So now they're using those phrases, and I, and I totally understand what you're saying. I think that before you walk into these communities, first of all, you have to go to the communities. You have to go talk to people. Don't do that. <laughs> What's that? Y'all don't do that. Don't, no, don't you're right. Do no. You're, you're right. And they don't do it because they're afraid of the press. That's why they don't do it. They're afraid of being called names. Mitt Romney tried to make a speech, and they just beat the crap out of him. Unfair, really unfairly, I thought. And and I think that, the, that this is the problem. We are being kept apart. We are being kept, look, who does it serve for you and me to not be able to talk to one another? It no. serves the powerful. It yeah. serves the powerful. If they can keep us apart, then they can play us off each other. It always serves the powerful. So that's what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing is a press that has worked very hard to make it impossible for us to talk. Because I, I gotta be honest with you, I, I talk to, um, to conservatives, right? I know like every important conservative in the country, and sometimes I hear them say things that aren't, they aren't, race, they aren't racist, they're just stupid. You know, they say things about poor communities where you say, well, these guys gotta pull themselves up by your bootstrap, and you say, you're 12 years old, you're mo you got a mom who's like addicted to something, you know, how, how the hell do you, where do you start? Where do you start without some help from somebody, you know? We can't be so certain of our theories that we can't help the actual people. So look, you gotta go in with more free market uh, solutions, like I'm really in favor of enterprise zones where you give people money to go in and build, you know, build businesses in suffering communities. I think you gotta come in with plans and ideas, but you gotta go in, you gotta go in, and you gotta say, you gotta take the heat. And this is one of the reasons guys like Trump and Giuliani are successful and actually help people is because they can take the heat because they're so crazy they don't care when people call them names, you know? But it takes a special person to do that. And what I would say, what I would say, is that in poor black neighborhoods, it would be good if people would start to say, well, let's bring them both in. Let's bring them in and debate. And, that's, and let's, let's ban the word racist. Let's just hear their ideas. Let's just hear the way they talk and, and hear what they have to say and what their policies do and why they say that. If people started doing that, I think Republicans would slowly, slowly creep in. I'll, let me finish with this, all right? But for a long time, black people were not hired as managers and coaches of football teams, managers of baseball teams. And when finally they said, all right, we'll hire them, they opened the door and nobody was there. Why? Because people aren't idiots, they know they're not welcome, they're not gonna show up, right? It took years for people to show up. The door has been shut in the faces of Republicans and they've gone away, and you're right, that's on them, but still, you gotta open the door. And so, I, I guess what I'm saying is you gotta make outreach possible for people without calling them names. And, and maybe they'll stop using the kind of phraseology you're talking about, because you're right, it's not, that's not helping anybody, you know? 
So I agree with so much of what you're saying. You know, I, I just think that somehow we've got to get around this barrier that's been created by the news media and Hollywood and the Academy that keeps telling you that everybody who disagrees with you is racist. I don't think it's necessary. I appreciate that. I don't think it's necessarily everybody's racist. Black people don't just use the word racist just to use it. We typically use it with a purpose. Um, when we say something's racist, it typically is. Nobody just uses it just to use it. I know there are some black people who just say that everything's racist. Nah. For rational black people, which most of us are, we use it when appropriate. Um, things like voter suppression is something that happens obviously on both sides. Uh, but it does happen mainly on y'all side in terms of African Americans. We saw it in Georgia with, uh, I believe his name is Kemp. With uh, he went against what's her name, Stacey Abrams. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he purged, I believe, it was fifty-three thousand votes from the voter rolls uh, in Georgia, and that had an adverse effect on her campaign. Um, voter suppression, things like that. How do I guess? How would you say that you guys can, you know, stop doing stuff like that that makes you know black people call y'all racist? Because well, well, I mean, I, I I don't want to get into this argument, but I see this issue entirely differently than you do. Okay. Whatever you do in this country, you need ID. Whatever you do in the country, you need ID. You need ID to get on a plane. You need ID to buy a bottle of booze. You need ID to get into a movie theater, you know, to just get cash a check, whatever. You should need ID to, to vote. That's not voter suppression. And when people say, you know, you sh people sh all people should need ID to vote, I understand there's a history there, and I understand the fear, and I think that's a real fear, and I understand. But that's not going to happen now. That's not what the Republicans are trying to do. And I think when you say that, and when you immediately say that's voter suppression, it just sounds, it, I, I think it, it doesn't sound rational to me that I need, I need an idea to do everything but vote. That doesn't make sense. So I guess what I mean is that debate, and even this Stacey Abrams debate, because I see that issue tr tremendously differently, those are debates that should be had on factual basis, on the basis of facts, not, I just think the word racist, I, even though I understand what you're saying, I think it should be banned, because I don't think there's any conversation. It's one of the worst things you can call a person in America how can you get to the next stage of a debate once you call a person racist? Actually, racism is worse than being called one, but that's just me. <laughs> well, yeah, but how in a conversation, how in a conversation with a person of goodwill, once you use that word, how can you get to the next step? Well, I don't call people racist just to call them racist. Like, their words and actions have to be that for me to say that. Listen, there are people I'd like to call a lot of things, but I don't call them, to, call them those names because I know I can't get to the next conversation, next part of the conversation if I do. I just think it's a word that is unhelpful. And I, and I think as unhelpful as what you're saying that Candace sometimes says, you know, I'm, I'm crazy about Candace, but I hear what you're saying. I, as, as difficult as that is, I feel the same way about calling people racist because I just don't see where the conversation can continue after that. I got to leave. He's <laughs> nudging me. Thanks very much. All right, this will be the last question. This is the last question. Say what? Oh, okay. Do you have a dissent? Uh, right. No, he can go. Okay. No, it's fine. You're good. Oh, sorry. So I don't have a lot of time, obviously. Um, so I'm going to take a page from your book and speak in generalities because the general generalities are generally true, right? You have also, <laughs> yeah. You have also said things like. Feminism seeks to transform women from first-rate women into second-rate men. The very fact that women wear leggings tells you that something the female body is meant to attract. Feminism has created this generation of women who think they matter because they're women, who think their ideas matter because they're women. You've also said, whenever women speak to me, I pretend to listen, then I pretend that they make sense. Whoa, You've whoa, also whoa. said... Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. You threw, in, you threw in a joke there. Hold on. I was with you up until that one. Okay. I think that one was a joke, yeah. <laughs> you can expunge that from the record. Uh, you have said, uh, I have no idea what these people are. I have no idea what a queer femme is. And finally, I'm anti-feminist. Yes. Um, all those things so, are true, and I said... So, all, yeah. since we're on the topic of fake news and extension, misrepresentation, one-sidedness, unwillingness to expand one's worldview... Um, what feminist philosophers and feminist writers have you read that you believe makes you a proper authority, a knowledgeable authority, to represent and report on something as complicated as feminism? Well, unfortunately for you, I've actually read everything, so that's, that's, not, gonna, that's not gonna help you. But, but I'm not even gonna go there, because I don't, 
I don't think you have to read feminist philosophy to see feminism in action, right? It's a political movement. You see feminism in action. There are a lot of people who say things that make sense on the page that when you put them in operation, I, I am an anti-feminist. And the re I, let me tell you why I'm an anti-feminist. It seems to me that feminism, instead of saying, I, I believe completely in the free and complete rights of all people, no matter what their sex, no matter which of the two sexes they are, all right, that's what I believe. All right, I believe the men and women have rights and they should have you know, free exercise to make any choice they want. What I don't agree with is the the idea that somehow male values are the right values and women who have a different set of values which have traditionally and I think rightly been called female values are somehow less than their male counterparts. So people who are told, oh, if you make a home for people, which to me is the greatest gift you can give anybody, right? I, I mean, if somebody like who has had a home made for him, it is the greatest thing in my life. If you give life to somebody, if you nurture that person with your body and with your time and you put aside your career, that somehow you've done something secondary to a guy who goes out and sells widgets at a widget factory and makes a lot of money. That to me is what feminists have essentially maneuvered themselves into, and I disagree with them completely. I think that one of the great joys of life is that there are men and women. I think that this is one of the blisses of life, and they've made it a problem. Now, listen, you can go back in history, and there was some point, probably around the 60s, 70s, when I would have agreed with them, when I did agree with them. But they have gone beyond that. They have gone beyond that to a point where I think they are anti-male, but they're, they're anti-male, but they're also anti-female. They're anti the values that most women hold and the things that most women feel are important. And I find that to be absurd. So you just read off a bunch of quotes, which I think you got from Media Matters, because they're after me all the time, right? I try to look at your direct okay. uh, videos okay. to make sure they were but, in context. But, but you're, I agree with all those quotes. I stand by every single one of them. because. Not because I don't want, listen, if a woman says to me, hey, I want to be an astronaut, you know, my feeling is, hey, be an astronaut. What, what difference does it make to me? I've got the greatest wife in the world. I don't care what you do. I'm not going out with any other women. That's it for me, okay? So, so I'm good. Please, please make the choices that you want. But don't make choice. Don't let people tell you that your secret dreams, your steepest dreams, are somehow invalid because they don't serve their political purposes. That is my uh, problem with feminism as a political movement, okay? And if, if we had time and you wanted to discuss certain philosophers, I, I would tear them apart because most of them are talking nonsense. However, however, what Thank really you. bothers me, what really bothers me, well, uh, because that was God, the question, who have you read, not what is feminism, who have I, you read? I, who haven't I read? I mean, you know, who was the woman, uh, who, Simone, de Beauvoir, Simone de Beauvoir, who said, one of the founding philosophers of feminism, you would agree, right? Yeah. She, she said that women should not be allowed to stay home and raise children because too many of them would make that choice. And my, I have a two-word answer to that, which I won't tell you. So, so anyway, I mean, I, I, look, I think, I think we have to agree that the, the attacks on men, remember, attacks on men are also attacks on little boys. Okay, when you talk about toxic masculinity, that's somebody's son you're talking about, right? And, and, and by the way, there's all, kind of, all kinds of toxic people in the world. Everybody, we're all broken people. We all fall short of the glory of God. So nobody, nobody has a, a lock on being a creep, okay? Nobody. I mean, I've, I've known all kinds of creeps of every color, every sex, all the, everything you can be, yeah, they're creeps, okay? But to say that people, are, you know, call people toxic because they're male, you know, is apt. it's disgusting. It's a disgusting way to talk to people, and it's a disgusting way to talk to half the human race. And, and look, if I heard people saying that stuff about women, and I sometimes have, I've told them the same thing, you know. I, I can't debate you, on, you know, for, for a long period of time, but that's my basic answer. We answer. don't have much time, yeah. but there are some recommendations in case you want to go further before, <laughs> you know, beyond Simone de Beauvoir, who has a lot of issues. Um, you know, Angela Davis, Bill Hooks, She's Patricia Hill Collins, <laughs> Alyssa Walker, <laughs> Maria Lugones. Who? This, Maria Lugones. No? Okay, you got one. I haven't read her. So. <laughs> well, the more you read, the better, you know? Uh, absolutely. I, read, I do read everything eventually. <laughs> All right. Well, since there's not enough time, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Angela, Angela Davis, man. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank Andrew Clavin for oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.